everyone, we appreciate you joining us today. Uh, we are gonna have a deep dive live session on our treasury bond futures funds. My name is Eric McArdle. I am a managing director on the client facing team here at Simplify. And with me, I have Peter Van Amson. Uh, before we get started and I share some info on the products as well as Pete's background, just wanna remind everyone at home that this is meant to be educational and informative. It is not meant to be investment advice. So with that, let's kick it over and Pete, we good on screen share? Yep, I can see you and Eric, thank you for uh, for kicking us off here. Perfect. So I wanna introduce Pete because Pete is an early member of the Simplify team and an integral member of the Simplify team and someone who we don't get out in front of clients enough because honestly, he is my go-to resource for all things risk. And that's appropriate given his role as head of risk management. So Pete is up in Boston uh, and actually now kind of moving around, uh, and moved out of Boston and back and forth between uh, Massachusetts and Colorado. Um, but uh, again, Pete's uh, career and experience speaks for itself. And so glad to have him on today to really get into the weeds behind our treasury future strategies. And let's just kind of set the table here. So for today's conversation, uh, we're gonna talk about TUA and TYA. And TUA uh, is a product in which we are owning treasury futures on the shorter end of the yield curve with capital efficiency in mind, which is a, another way of saying leverage to get to a duration profile that is uh, closer to the belly or the middle part of the yield curve. TYA, on the other hand, is doing a similar thing, except using uh, treasury futures that are in the middle of the yield curve to match duration on the long end of the yield curve. And so uh, with that in mind, let's set the table here for Pete and talk about why we did what we did within these products. Great. Uh, thanks, Eric. And uh, thank you for the kind words at the introduction. I uh, appreciate that. Um, so as Eric mentioned, we have two products that we're going to talk about today. Uh, one with the ticker TUA, the other with the ticker TYA. Uh, first really interesting thing to note is that uh, TU is the beginning of the two-year futures contract uh, ticker in uh, Bloomberg, and TY is the beginning of the 10-year note futures contract um, in Bloomberg. And if you look at the, the ticker TUA, you will see that there's one for our equity, our ETF. But there's also one for the active TU contract. And likewise for TYA, there's one for the active TY contract. And then obviously the ticker for our fund. Um, as we look at uh, these products, uh, the big thing that they offer the investment community is access uh, to leverage in, in a safe and convenient way. Um, prior to these products, uh, leverage really came in, I would say kind of complicated wrappers. Um, and what we wanted to do is we wanted to give sort of garden variety, you know, John Q public, uh, everyday citizen investors access to futures accounts. Um, and we wanted to take the management of uh, the complexities of dealing with futures out of the equation and give people the opportunity to essentially just go out and obtain leverage to, let's say, the two-year point um, or a, a point on the yield curve that's in the belly. Um, if we look at bond futures generically, um, they allow you really to separate the amount of risk, the duration that you have, uh, from the point on the yield curve or the maturity um, which you would create that uh, leverage with. Um, so, you know, you could go out and buy a two-year note, or you could go out and borrow a two-year note with a futures contract and have essentially the same risk. Now, what's nice is you can borrow the two-year note in a quantity that exceeds the amount of cash that you have. So you could be, for instance, two times levered or three times levered to... Uh, the two-year note, um, and that would give you a duration that looks something more like the duration of a four and a five-year note. Um, the ability to do that, to separate, you know, where on the curve you create your exposure, as well as how much 
exposure you have is really the, the, the primary benefit of using futures contracts. So they're often used as a hedge, as a for instance, um, where you might have another exposure that you want to neutralize. Um, they're also used to express a view. Um, you know, you think that you know the belly of the curve is going to go up or the belly of the curve is going to go down, and you want to create an exposure to that. And a futures contract allows you to do that. Um, now there are listed futures contracts in a variety of places on uh, the U.S. Treasury curve, um, and we focused on two of them. So TUA is the roughly the 1.75 to two year part of the the curve, and TYA right now lives in the six and a half to seven and three quarter year range of uh, the, the Treasury curve. There are other futures contracts. Um, they are less liquid in that they aren't traded as frequently um, and often just less interesting to, to people. And we'll go into you know some of the reasons why that is. Um, can we, can, we, pa can we pause here for a minute? I have a question for you that I'm sure others are, are thinking about as well. So we bolded out these six and a half to 7.75 year uh, positions on the curve. And I just want to kind of tie that to a 10 year future. Can you add some color here, please? Uh, well, the, the, it is just the feed that, that is the, the contract specification uh, that you know, basically we are looking at a 10 year note contract. What's interesting about it is because of the shape of the yield curve, um, the, the, the cheapest to deliver uh, security for that futures contract tends to live in the six and a half to seven and three quarter years to, to expiry, uh, to maturity range. Got it. Thank you. Yep. yep. So, you know, we have these two futures contracts, you know, one that's a, you know, kind of the front end of the curve, as close to policy rates as you could get with a futures contract. And then one that really lives in the belly of the curve, that six and a half, seven and three quarter range. Uh, that, that's an interesting spot, you know, as we go through and look at the history of the treasury curve, we'll see that various points in time, that's been a pretty interesting place to have exposure. Um, the other really neat and convenient place, a holder that the futures contracts have is, you know, the IRS kind of threw up their hands and said, we don't know if this is a long term or a short term. So for futures contracts, if they're cleared, Regardless of your holding period, be it a day or a year or five years, you're always going to get the same uh, treatment. 60% of the PL from that futures contract is going to be treated as a long term gain. And 40% of the PL from that futures contract is going to be treated as a short term capital gain or loss. You know, this puts you in a spot where the, the PL from the, the futures contract is taxed at a lower marginal tax rate, 26.8% uh, versus, you know, the, the, the maximum uh, federal tax tax rate. So, you know, th there's a little bit of a, a potentially nice tax advantage, um, depending upon, you know, what, what, you're, what you're looking at uh, with the tax treatment as well. Uh, one other sort of side note on tax treatment, it isn't in the slide deck, but it, it, it's worth noting, is we, we hold the collateral, essentially the, the corpus of the fund, you know, the excess cash, as it were. We, we buy T-bills with that. And those T-bills, because it's treasury length income, um, that income is excluded from uh, state and local taxes, which is also you know, maybe, maybe something that matters to, to some investors, um, but um, yeah, particularly if you live in a high tax state. So uh, yeah, I guess we, we can roll on to the next slide. Um, so now if, if we think about where the return in a futures contract comes from, it really comes from what we can think of as, 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 as two places, at least conceptually. We can think of the static performance um, of a futures contract. And, and the way that I typically define static and is often a, a fixed income uh, convention is people think of their static income as the income that would accrue to them if the world doesn't change except for one thing, that one thing being that the calendar moves forward. Um, the first really obvious place where a fixed income security produces income is in the coupon payments. So, you know, every day you come in, 
interest accrues, periodically interest gets paid. Um, that that that's a pretty straightforward one. Um, <clears throat> the other place that isn't maybe not as straightforward, but certainly fixed income aficionados think a lot about, is what we call roll. And the way we can think about roll is, you know, when you look at a fixed income security, it has a whole bundle of future cash flows that get discounted to come up with the value of the security. If, for instance, let's say we're looking at a five-year bond today, and then we look at that same package of cash flows four years from now, um, we're going to be left with essentially just two coupon payments and also a, a giant um, principal payment. The discount rate at which, let's say, that five-year bond gets discounted can be very different from the discount rate at which that same remaining set of cash flows gets discounted as a one-year bond. If we imagine the curve having a, a significant shape, let's say either upward sloping as maturity increases or downward sloping as maturity increases, roll returns can have a big impact on your static performance as well. Uh, for instance, in a very steep curve environment, uh, moving from, let's say, a five-year treasury to a four-year treasury, um, if the rate is materially different, um, you will end up with um, a significant bit of your performance coming from mole. So a lot of, uh, you know, again, fixed income professionals pay attention to roll, and often they will, let's say, choose a position in the belly of the curve, um, somewhere between, let's say, 10 and five years, uh, over a position that is at the long end of the curve, where the curve tends to be flat, uh, to, to pick up some additional roll yield. So that's the static driver of, of performance. And you know, I wanted to pause here. I don't know if Eric has any questions on that. Um, nope, I'm all good. Let's keep going. Okay, great, great. And then, you know, the second bit of performance for fixed income security is, is you know, somewhat obvious, is that, you know, rates can change. And so the remaining cash flows uh, for a fixed income security uh, can um, can increase or decrease in present value because of the rate change. Um, and if you think about the yield curve, there are different parts of the curve that may have more volatility than other parts. For instance, you can think of, let's say, a 30-year uh, rate as one that is the average of all the rates between today and 30 years from now. Um, so you might imagine a 30-year rate as being fairly stable. Um, you can compare that to, let's say, a one-year rate, where the one-year rate might move around a great deal, depending upon you know, expectations that relate to uh, growth, expectations that relate to uh, Fed policy, expectations that relate to current rates of inflation, as, as just as a, as a, for instance, you know, some of the things that might whip current rates around uh, but not uh, long-term, long-dated rates. Um, obviously, you know, one important driver of how these dynamic changes in rates relate to performance is the sensitivity of that present value to uh, the change in rate. You know, that's the term commonly known as duration. Uh, but, you know, again, you know, we want to think about both the static and dynamic drivers of um, of performance when we think about fixed income securities. Now, why is this important? Well, this is important because we're going back and we're thinking about um, wanting to choose different parts of the curve as places that we want to have exposure to. Um, and different parts of the curve can have very different behaviors as they relate to obviously coupon rates or roll rates, and then how volatile those rates actually are. Um, so, um, you know, that I guess that's where we're turning next. And you know, this is a, a fairly long term history of, uh, of fixed income rates or rates on treasuries. And these are what are known as par coupons. So, this is the coupon that would price a, a, the on the run treasury of a given maturity uh, to equal its face value. Um, and these are just averaged by decade. I look at um, daily values, and, and this is all data from the Fred database, uh, pretty straightforward. 
But, you know, we see some very obvious things. You know, rates have come down a great deal over the, the last, um, you know, 50 or so years. Um, and, you know, recently, you know, maybe they've, they've rebounded a little bit, but they're still, you know, relatively low by, you know, at least this 50-year historical standard. Um, so, you know, that that's, you know, one feature. And then the other feature that's worth noting um, is, let, let's go back up to that, um, that slide, yeah. The other feature is that the curve various points in time has been flat uh, to upward sloping um, in general as an average. And this is important because we're going to look at the next slide, the one that looks at roll yield, um, where we can see that you know the role of a of a of a um, of a particular position can vary dramatically over time. For instance, you know in, in the in the teens, it was a great time to own a seven year uh, security because there was a lot of yield to be obtained. From roll. Uh, similarly, um, in the 1990s, riding the front end of the curve, let's say from two years to one year, uh, looked really, really attractive. Um, in the 2020s, uh, we can see that there hasn't been much in the way of roll yield. Much of that is influenced probably by our current yield curve environment. Um, but again, it, it, it's it's a it's an interesting thing to to think about. And uh, Let's let's roll on to the next slide now. Here we look at essentially the volatility of that roll yield. So again, how stable is that roll yield? You know, if we're if we're playing for static yield, um, how how volatile is it? And this is kind of the, the last little piece of that. We can see that you know as duration goes up. Um, the the risk, as it were, in trying to pick up that roll yield also goes up. Um, you know, very broad trend. You know, one thing that's kind of interesting, though, if you look again at that five to seven year segment, um, has kind of a middling amount of um, of risk, but a pretty high amount of roll yield. Um, so that you know that that's one slide. And then you know, let's say let's look at the next slide, and here we kind of put it all together. Here we look at a, a relatively long history. So this is May of 1977 through October of 2023. And we look at three parts of the curve, what I would call the front end of the curve, the two-year point, the belly, the 10-year point, and then the 30-year the point. And here we're looking at essentially a risk versus return plot. And we can see over time, um, you know, if, if you draw a line leaving from the origin, to a particular point, the slope of that line is really telling you the risk return trade-off. Um, you can see at various points in time, risk return is pretty good uh, for the front end of the curve, um, but it is quite varied. Um, it tends to not be very good at the long end of the curve. You know that that slope line is pretty flat. And then in the you know what's nice is if you look at the the ten year point, you can see that. Um, it is somewhat varied, but it also is somewhat high. Um, so that might be an interesting place to play. Um, if, if you were an investor, you wouldn't necessarily look at these dots as a set. You'd look at the current set of dots and try to find the spot that they gave you the best, um, the best trade-off. So you know, that, that's kind of where, where we are with this slide. And then now looking at our you know, our, our really our last sort of data oriented slide. Here we look at the yield curve, um, let's say three years ago, which was a, you know, quote unquote normal upward sloping yield curve, albeit at a very low level. Um, so it had some term premium, you know, roughly 150 or so basis points of term premium between spot and 30 years. Um, and then we can look at our, our more recent yield curves, which, which are kind of interesting in that we have um, an inverted yield curve um, with current rates being quite high and uh, long-term rates not being particularly attractive. So, you know, in this setup, um, you know, these, these current rates are offering a pretty attractive 
uh, return. Um, they also potentially create an opportunity for people to, to think about um, taking a view on policy rates. Um, again, you know, we're, we're not in the business of offering investment advice, but it is it's certainly a very interesting world. If you think about, let's say, two-year rates being um, you know, roughly 5% and uh, the 30-year rates uh, being at, at roughly 4.5%. Um, so certainly uh, an interesting juxtaposition of data. Um, and Pete, just off the top of your head, I mean, how rare is it for the yield curve to be inverted like this? I mean, if you had to say, you know, of the total observation set, is it inverted the way it is now, say, 5% of the time, 10% of the time? Is it less frequent than that? Not to put you on the spot, but... Um, just you know, I, I'm going to say heuristically, probably in the 10% range. Um, you know, it could be as low as 5%. You know, the, the, the policy implications of that are, you know, usually policy rates are quite high. Um, and the, the central bank is trying to cool things off. Um, the market is saying, okay, you may succeed at that, but you might end up cratering the economy, uh, which is, is driving, let's say, forward rates, which we can't see in this picture, uh, to, to be substantially lower than, than the spot rates um, in, in, in the short term. So if we look, for instance, at, let's say, SOFR futures for today's curve, you would see a SOFR, which is sort of a three-month fully secured rate, uh, be a very exaggerated version of the uh, of the green lines, where the spot rates um, are at five, five and a half. Some of those sofa rates might be at five, six, five, seven, and where the spot rates are, let's say, in the one to two year range, where they're um, you know between five and four and a half. Those might be uh, rates that have a three handle to them. Um, so it, you know, it, it, it is a, it, it's an interesting sort of set of policy uh, implications that are that are coming out of this this curve environment for sure. Got it. And before we move to the next slide, I just want to make sure that everyone's attention is drawn to the TUA and the TYA labels on the yield curve, just as a mental point of reference for you know the rest of the conversation. So we're going to take a little detour here, and we're going to jump into some of the, the mechanics of what the products are and how they work. To date, we've talked a little bit about curve dynamics. We've talked a little bit about um, futures contracts you know, at a high level. And now we're going to start to dive in a little bit and maybe scratch a little below the surface. Um, by, by construction, TUA um, is set up to, to have roughly five to one leverage to the two-year point. So when you look at the duration of a two-year bond, you're gonna see it's you know, a little bit south of two, which means that TUA is gonna have a duration number that's you know a little bit south of 10. And not surprisingly, we see a duration of 9.35. Um, TYA is levered roughly three to one um, on kind of that, I would say that that's six and a half to seven year point on the curve. Um, again, that bond is going to have a duration uh, with a with a low six handle, and that is going to end up giving you TYA duration of three and a half percent or of a three point one times levered or eighteen point two five percent. Um, the, um, the the interesting thing here is that we've essentially created a fund that has, you know, in, in TUA's case, is, is spending or, or has the, the, the buying power of five times its NAV on the two-year bond, and TYA has, you know, roughly three times its NAV in terms of buying power on the, on the treasury future. So how do we do this? Um, we essentially use the futures contracts, the, the TU futures contract for, for TUA and the TY futures contract um, for, um, for TYA. And just a note here, it's something we, we didn't have on the slide, but it's important. So that leverage or that exposure to the part of the curve via futures contracts, 
we are rolling or resetting those contracts on a quarterly basis. So there's no daily leverage component or daily reset component that might be associated with products that are using swaps or other features. Um, this really is a, you know, uh, putting a position on the curve, giving you that leverage ratio, and then every quarter we'll go back and reset it. So, you know, you know at a very, very high level, um, your, your, your construction and things that rebalance daily is going to create a lot of volatility drag. Whereas something that doesn't rebalance daily is, is going to end up having um, a little bit less volatility drag. Um, so if those of you who are familiar with the concept of volatility drag, uh, something something to keep in mind. And of course, you know we we kind of pinned the yield curve, you know, in everyone's mind a moment ago. And just again, I want to flash this on screen so you can think about how these products can be useful you know, when trying to get precise exposure, but let's say with, you know, a, um, additional conviction, right? Uh, if you were to go and purchase an unlevered bond or, um, you know, uh, an unlevered bond ETF, you can pick out that exposure on the curve, but you're limited then to, you know, the duration of that unlevered position, right? So by using treasury futures, you're now able to get you know much more precise exposure with the duration or the, the sensitivity to movements of the curve that you might be looking for. Um, and TUA in particular is very interesting in that regard in that, you know, to my knowledge in the exchange traded space, there is no other uh, solution that allows you to get that type of uh, duration on the front end. So it's nicely differentiated there. Yeah. And so just to kind of wrap up this slide then, um, again, thinking about how to use these, you know, tactically, uh, you can you know, look at the yield curve and then decide, okay, how do I want to be positioned, you know, on the front end with uh, additional conviction or do I want to be positioned in the belly, right? And then, you know, going back to the slides that Pete discussed, right, when thinking about a, a normal curve environment, um, and then, you know, thinking about where the roll yield potential or coupon potential is enhanced uh, and then positioning there accordingly is also another way to play this. And so that kind of leads us into our next slide. Unless, Pete, did you have another comment there? Uh, no, no, I, I think I think it'll become apparent as we look at the mechanics. So now we're, we're jumping in. We're not fully in the in the in the weeds yet in terms of. Um, diving in, but you know, we're starting to get there. And we're just going to look at a numerical example. And this is stylized that, that kind of describes how the, the, the fund in terms of its performance um, you know, mechanically works. So you know, we can start with uh, treasury bills. So short-term treasuries yielding roughly 2%. Uh, the cost to borrow in the futures market uh, being at 1.8%. We'll talk briefly about why that is in a moment where those two aren't necessarily the same. Um, and then we'll, we'll say, let's say that the 10 year treasury, the underlying for our 10 year futures contract. So it, it actually may be a slightly different treasury, maybe something uh, with more like seven and a half to eight years uh, to, or seven and a half years to expiry, um, has a yield of 3%. And the strategy in this case, just to make the numbers easy, is levered uh, three times to that uh, futures contract. In this case, you know, the fund is going to hold all its cash. So that cash is going to be invested in a T-bill. So we're going to get the 2% yield on the T-bill. And then we're also going to get the yield on the underlying bond, in this case, the 10-year, say it's 3% minus the borrowing cost, the 1.8%. Um, and then if we bought the appropriate number of contracts to get ourselves three times levered, times three. So in this case, there are a couple of things that are worth noting. You know, one, we're, we're, we're sort of magnifying the yield difference between the 10-year the point on the curve and the three-month point on the curve. So right off the bat, you know, we see that you know, we're kind of doing what a bank is able to do. We can borrow short-term, invest long-term, 
And that gives us the ability to pick up a multiple of that 3% minus 2% uh, difference, which is you know quite nice. Um, and then in addition to that, the other nice feature of this is that we're actually borrowing at a rate that's a little bit better than T-bill collateral or the T-bill is actually writing that 2%. Um, part of the reason that rate is a little bit better is futures, excuse me, futures contracts actually aren't tied to a specific bond for a variety of reasons. You know, probably the most basic one is you wouldn't want everybody in the futures market chasing exactly the same bond that would create a massive squeeze. Um, so futures instead have a basket of bonds that can be delivered. Um, typically a dozen or so bonds are eligible for delivery. And then the window for delivery is, is typically about a month long as well. So this allows the market for these futures to be a lot more liquid in that you're not exposed to squeeze risk or, or, the, or exposure to squeeze risk is greatly reduced. But it does create for the person who's long the futures contract, in this case, uh, in our example, we would be long uh, that 10 year futures contract, which is yielding roughly 3%. Um, we are long that, but we're actually short those options. The person who is, is, is short the futures contract can decide what bond to deliver. They can decide when to deliver it. So that's an option. And for that option to be fairly priced, something needs to give. And in fact, what gives is usually the cost to borrow is a little bit lower than the, the rate that you would earn on, on cash um, in, in, let's say, the, a pure repo market or a pure T-bill market. Um, those delivery options, you know, that that's where you, that, I guess that's a layer below where we're going to go in, in this presentation, but at least, you know, I just wanted to touch upon, you know, why that might be. Um, in any case, that's, that's example number one, one that would make, let's say, I'm going to say three to probably eight years ago, uh, the 10 year futures contract, the one that is covered by TYA, a really attractive investment. You would essentially be picking up the yield differential uh, that's in, embedded in an upward sloping yield curve. Uh, curves were pretty stable during that time period. Um, so you're getting some nice roll yield. You're getting this funding advantage. You know, everybody's happy. The folks at PIMCO were just, you know, ecstatic with this. They were doing this, you know, printing C notes, uh, doing this. But obviously it's not the environment we're in now, but it is, um, you know, it, it is kind of the way it would work if the yield curve is as described here. So now we're looking at maybe a more typical example for the current environment. Um, and here we're looking at, let's say, T-bills yielding 5.3%. The cost to borrow is actually greater than the T-bill yield. Um, so even though we're short that option, uh, funding market is one where the rate is higher. Um, the market rate on a U.S. Treasury is about 4.9%. And we're again three times leveraged. So here we get the 5.3 on our cash effectively. We earn the 4.9 on the T bill. I'm sorry, on the treasury, the 10 year. And we're borrowing at 5.4%. So, and the whole thing is magnified by three times. So, right off the bat, the 40 basis point difference between the long end of the curve and the short end of the curve is magnified by three. So we're, we're giving up some, some of our performance there. And then it gets, it gets a little bit less attractive with the cost of borrow actually exceeding the yield on the security that we're borrowing to buy as well. So this whole thing ends up putting you in a spot where your, your current um, position is set up to yield about 3.8%, which is quite a bit lower than the current yield on, um, you know, essentially on cash. Um, so that's, you know, kind of, kind of a, you know, a feature of, of, of where we are today, um, you know, which, which makes, you know, can, can make um, 
these these securities much more interesting uh, for use in a, in a tactical environment. Um, you know, for instance, if you think rates are going to go down, uh, you're essentially magnifying uh, your your duration in a way that that could be attractive to you. Um, if you think the curve is going to steepen, putting a weighted combination of TYA and TUA on uh, would also give you the opportunity to to create a position that that benefits from that, regardless of level or focused on steepening. Um, so that that kind of uh, concludes our prepared comments. Um, I, I promised Eric I'd take about half an hour to twenty five minutes, or twenty five minutes to half an hour. I've run over by a bit. Um, apologies for that. Um, hopefully, we've got some uh, some interesting and exciting questions, and love love to entertain those. No, that was great, Pete, and appreciate it. I know that um, you know our audience definitely learned a lot. And I have two quick uh, one question and one comment that I want to raise before we open it up to the group. Um, it just as a comment. You know, looking at this slide right here, I just want to note that you can, of course, interchange, you know, the yields, right? So you can take a, the yield on a two-year uh, bond or two-year future and change the leverage ratio here to give you some type of illustrative example for, um, you know, a two-year levered position. And then we had talked about duration earlier. And Pete, for a guy that ha is still learning about bonds and still getting, um, you know, comfortable with bond math and bond terms, uh, a general rule of thumb that I've come across is that a duration figure gives you an easy way to approximate what an investment is going to do if yields move you know, X percent. And so for example, let's say if yields move 1% lower or higher, and again, this is all hypothetical and not related to the investments we're talking about, but a duration figure, uh, let's say of 10, gives you a 10% move in either direction. Is that a fair uh, you know, way to kind of approximate that? It, it is. Uh, th there's one important caveat. You know, duration, you can think of it as, as, as the first derivative um, of you know, price with respect to yield. That's, that's the, you know, the math C definition of this. So if, if you take a 1% change and the duration is 10, then the impact uh, of that 1% change would be roughly a 10% change in the value. That's the first order effect. Um, a big move, like 100 basis points, has uh, the potential to have a lot of convexity. So if you think about a two-year bond um, and multiply that by five, let's say to get a duration of 10, that's going to have a little bit less convexity than uh, a 10-year bond times one because convexity grows as um as duration as, as actual maturity grows and here we're looking at um taking a short maturity security and levering it up to give it the duration of a long um of a long maturity security so that that would be the only caveat um one of the nice things about the two year is it, it 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 doesn't have a lot of convexity. So for the two year duration pretty much describes what's going to happen. Um, so you lever it up five times, it's going to be pretty much the duration of a two year bond times five. Um, that's not strictly speaking true for let's say a 10 year bond if you lever it up three times um, and you have a price change um, and let's say the duration is 18 or so, you're actually going to see a little bit more because convexity there is, is going to help you uh, a little bit more um, on that um, on that 10 year bond than it would on a um, you know on a two year bond. Got it. Thank you. All right. Well, let's uh, conclude the formal presentation. And um, we will hang around for Q&A. And I just want to announce before we do that, that uh, our next Deep Dive Live is going to be on MTBA. And we will be hosting that on January 25th with Harley Bassman. And uh, just as a refresher, MTBA is uh, the new Simplify MBS ETF.
Okay. So on the questions, we've got a few here and um, let's see. So first that I want to address here is on the tax treatment of futures contracts. The question is, does that tax treatment flow through to the fund investor? And um, I, I can start with this, Pete. I mean, we talked about the, the cash collateral or the treasury bills and their you know, distinct features and how those gains would be taxed and passed through. Uh, when it comes to the futures contracts, as you are rolling those, you know, assuming you have a gain on the roll, that would then generate um, income essentially at the 60-40 tax rate. Uh, and of course, you as an ETF holder, you can monetize or sell the fund at any point on your own and then have your own, you know, respective short or long-term capital gains rate associated with that. Any other color here, Pete? Uh, yeah, I mean, just, you know, at the end of the year, we will, you know, tell you what the you know, treasury linked uh, income is. So, you know, for your state and local taxes, you'll be able to, to peel it out. Um, the other thing that's important to note is we, we essentially plan to uh, distribute all of the income. So, you know, if you're a cash basis or a pool basis uh, taxpayer, it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, if, if, if let's say the fund produced, you know, 50 cents a share in income over the course of the year, you will see dividends of roughly 50 cents a share over the course of the year. Um, sometimes we'll be a little bit over, a little bit under. Um, and, you know, if we're over, some of the dividends will be a return of capital to you and that won't be taxable. Um, if we're under, you know, at some point, you know, we'll probably be catching up. Uh, but our, obviously our intention isn't ever to put the fund in a spot where um, it has large, large amounts of, of, of taxable income that hasn't been distributed to, to the investors. That, that's not the objective of these funds. Very good. Looks like we answered some questions regarding what to expect in terms of, you know, the static holding for these positions. Um, again, using the formulas that we showed on screen. Uh, we didn't give the exact figures, but you can kind of use those formulas now to you know, follow the yield curve and guesstimate the approximate yield on the portfolios. Um, let's see. So as part of that, you know, and I, I guess this is kind of a carry on to that question. Uh, Derek asks, with the inverse curve on TUA, what's the cost of the roll back up every quarter ballpark? I know it can and will change. It definitely will change and it, it has changed. And I think just, you know, um, without getting into specifics, know that it is lower than the cash bond, though still positive uh, as far as like the total carry on the portfolio. Right. So the the funding spread, as we we described earlier in a inverted curve environment is negative. And so your cost for leverage is negative. However, that can still be offset by your Treasury bill portfolio uh, yield. Yeah. Quick, you know, quick math. The the rate roll on the two year um, is actually quite small. It's roughly one and a half basis points per month negative. So really, really tiny. Um, the the biggest driver of performance for um, TUA is the volatility of of that two year point on the curve. So if, if that if that yield curve point moves up, TUA is going to you know take it in the teeth a little bit. If it moves down, maybe it's going uh, to do quite nicely. You know, that that that's you know that's really where the action is in um, in TUA current current environment with repo and the shape of the curve, the the, the static sort of yield on TUA. You know, it was quite a bit lower than, let's say, the 5.5 to 5.25 that you would get on a T-bill or a TIP. Um, it is, you know, it, it, it's got a typically a one to a three handle. It does vary somewhat uh, depending upon where we are relative to the roll date. But, um, you know, good, good ballpark number is probably a mid three handle. We have a few questions on some of our other strategies. And again, we're kind of in the tail end of the presentation, so this won't be in our replay. But um, we have one question on coupling TUA, TYA, and PFIX as a basket. 
And um, obviously we cannot give investment advice. So I just want to put that out there, you know, as a disclaimer prior to us answering this, but you know, when thinking about that yield curve, and I'll just pull that back up for reference. Please. Okay. So just as a visual point on the curve, you can kind of think of PFIX as being out here. And, you know, obviously there are some, you know, other points to this, but generally, right, yields lower benefits TUA and TYA yields higher on the back end benefits mm -hmm. PFIX. Yeah. Right. And so with that in mind, Pete, how do you think about pairing these together, uh, especially given the current environment and then maybe, you know, tying that into um, steepener trades, which are yeah. popular among our investor base? Yeah. So, you know, the classic sort of steepener trade would be to be, you know, long the, the rate that you think is going to, or long the part of the curve that you think is going to go down. So clearly you want to be long something in TUA land. Um, and then short, uh, hopefully conditionally short, something at the long end of the curve. Um, and PFIX is a great tool for that. And then the, the game really about this becomes, you know, how, how do you weight these two? Um, and do you really care that much about the belly would be the other sort of question that I would ask. Um, you know, the, the duration of TUA is, you know, call it, you know, just, just to make the map easy for myself, I'm going to call it 10. And the, the duration of PFIX in the opposite direction um, is, is roughly 30. So, you know, that that's that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, you could you could say I'm, I'm interested in doing a three to one. So three times two, uh, um, one times PFIX. So, you know, 25 bucks in PFIX and 75 bucks in, in TUA. That would be one approach. But you could refine that, sharpen the pencil a little bit and say, well, you know, long-term rates are not as volatile as uh, short-term rates. So maybe I want a little bit more uh, juice in the part of the curve that I think is going to move. And I'm just interested in owning PFIX as an insurance policy. Um, and, you know, maybe there you would, you would shade it to be something like five to one. So, you know, have, you know, roughly... No, I picked the wrong number. I should, but I'm going to say four to one just because it's easy for me to, me to do the math. So, you know, 80 bucks in, in TUA and 20 bucks in PFIX. Um, if, if I wanted to do, you know, instead of four to one, five to one, it would be, you know, 80 something bucks and, you know, 83 bucks or so and 16 bucks um, in terms of, you know, how I might want to weight these. Um, you know, I, I think that 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 would be the way that I would think about it. Um, PYA, it's a little bit of a, it, it, you, you're kind of betting on, you know, what's going to happen where with, with TYA. I'm sure the belly of the curve has come down a fair bit. Um, but my guess is if the curve steepens out, it, most of the action is going to be at the front end of the curve. And you own PFIX as, as an insurance product more than anything else. That if you know the curve continues to go up, um, you know, you've got something that pays you. That that would be the way that I would think about it. it, it Again, just not to, investment advice. <laughs> it, it definitely not. Definitely not. But helpful. It's really helpful context. And yeah. I think having, you know, the approximate duration figures and kind of knowing, you know how they they pan uh, or balance together against each other um, is really helpful in you know crafting again specialized trades right and that's what these tools allow you to do so um just to to kind of you know add the steepener language because I know that's something that people are talking about right so pfix and, and Pete you correct me if I'm wrong pfix is a way to express a bear steepener i.e the back end rising. Whereas TUA is a way to express a bull steepener trade, i.e. the front end falling. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's correct. I would I would add that the really sort of nice, delicious feature of uh, PFIX, though, is that it, it's actually sensitive not to spot rates, but to forward rates. So if you think about a bull steepener, 
it would need to be quite bullish to really cause damage to to pfix you know if if you look at let's say the a long term rate you know 20 year treasury at 4% that's kind of where we are now um that's not a crazy crazy rate that's you know 2% real plus you know a, a little bit of term premium uh gets you to 4% so you you could you know pretty reasonably say, you know, a, a normal yield curve might look something like, you know, policy rates at two percent, treasuries at uh, twenty year treasuries at four percent. In, in that sort of environment, forward math really helps you in a, in a kind of a cool way. You, you kind of look at what happens to the forwards, and you'll see that the forward that underlies the, the security that that is PFIX actually doesn't go down. It actually goes up. Um, so you could, in that sort of rotation type trade, you you could win on both sides of your steeper, um, which is which is kind of kind of cool. Yeah, kind of cool indeed. So we have one more question, and this goes to the idea of using these products with other fixed income solutions. Um, so in, in particular, uh, some of our products were mentioned, AgH and High. And, you know, the question is, how do how do we incorporate or think about incorporating these treasury future strategies you know, into uh, an existing fixed income portfolio? And I'll, I'll kind of start with this, Pete. I mean, I, I think, and, you know, we're talking to allocators all the time and we get this similar question. You know, I think, again, it goes back to one thinking about you know the curve shape and where you want to be on that curve and now having tools that allow you to express that view also having duration without you know credit risk or without you um you know other forms of risk that we utilize in other products like volatility equity vol short bond volatility right so you're kind of you know again you're you're much more precise on the curve to where you want to be and you're also using treasuries, which do not have that credit risk component. Um, and so you can use these as either tactical views, right? Based on the, the curve and where it is, or as strategic positions, if you're in a market where that curve shape is conducive to, you know, good yield or good portfolio role yield. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And you know, we internally, we will use um, a mix of things. Sometimes we'll use the futures contracts that we're trading in TUA and TYA inside of our funds. Um, sometimes we'll go out and just buy TUA and TYA. Um, with regard to the options that are in PFIX, um, it's, it's much more efficient for us just to buy and sell um, our positions in, in PFIX. And again, we've done that with our internal funds, you know, either to add convexity uh, to uh, a fixed income portfolio or to uh, potentially take a view on steepening. Uh, both of those have, you know, have, have been you know, interesting things to do. You know, if, if you look at um, the notion of using TYA to give you duration, to give you more duration, um, you, you might be interested in that, but you also may wanna add some convexity to that. So instead of uh, buying, let's say a 30 year bond with cash, you can replicate the um, the duration and convexity of that position uh, pretty nicely with some investment in the 10-year futures contract and the ownership uh, of, of a pay fixed swap in. Um, you know, so that that that's kind of a, a cool feature. At least you know you you end up with conditional convexity effectively. Um, it does particularly well if if rates go up. Um, it, that position is not going to get slaughtered the way a 30 year bond would, but it would still give you the same duration you know, on, a, on a down move in rates. Makes perfect sense. So, with that, we've wrapped up all of our questions. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Pete, this was a lot of fun. Uh, I always learn something from you, so uh, appreciate your knowledge and insight. And thank you all at home for watching and tuning in. If you have any questions, please visit simplify.us and hit contact us. Or 
check us out on Twitter, YouTube, anywhere else where we're publishing content. And you can follow us when we release other videos like this or other pieces of content. Uh, thank you all. I hope you have a great night.